to events like this and they ask for my title, their, the affiliation and, and bio, I always struggle uh, because I can't easily fit into a box. I'm a, I'm a journalist by uh, training. I'm former editor of the Chronicle of Higher Education. I'm author of two New York Times bestsellers, including a new one that was just released uh, last uh, September by Simon & Schuster uh, about the year I spent inside the college admissions process uh, in the US. I also have an academic affiliation as a special advisor on innovation to the president at Arizona State University. And a third strand of work uh, is consulting with universities and organizations uh, that do business with uh, higher education. And increasingly, as we heard from Pamela this morning, uh, this world of work reflects this mashup of activities, right? As, as Larry said, it's messy. Um, whether talent works for themselves, like I do, or for an organization. Um, yet, uh, when we think about our education system, it's largely designed around three pillars. It's largely designed for young people, right? When you think of education, when somebody says education, we think educating the young. Uh, we think of physical places, right? We think of schools, classrooms, college campuses, and we think of it in an episodic way. What do I mean by that? Everybody always says, I'm gonna go back to school or I'm going to school. We think of education as something we do when we stop doing something else. Uh, and that's especially true of adults when we say we're gonna stop work to go back to get an education. And I think the last 15 or 16 months has really exposed the shortcomings of this traditional model of education and particularly of higher education in much of the developed world. There are two principles of this standard model of doing business that I think have been called into question by the pandemic. First is that higher education is a residential, face-to-face -face learning experience that's mostly done at one time in life, right? Young people going to college and then entering the workforce, kind of the, the one and done model, uh, or maybe two and done if you go get a graduate degree. And second, the other thing that I think has been called into question by the pandemic is that higher ed is a ticket to a good job and thus worth the cost in all cases. Uh, the truth is that I think consumers are increasingly questioning the value of higher education because the outcomes, like we talked about this morning, don't always provide a clear connection to the workforce, right? Employers want one thing, colleges and universities are delivering something else. So let's take a moment to unpack those two things. The physical, residential, face-to-face -face piece of it and this outcomes value uh, piece of it. Um, first is this residential piece, right? That a person goes somewhere to get educated. Well, I think we can all agree when the world pivoted to remote education during COVID-19, it really became difficult in my mind to differentiate one institution's brand from another when largely a lot of people were at home or somewhere learning online. We heard derisive, uh, derisive terms like uh, uh, glorified Skype, for example, to describe what universities were offering, often at a price that was barely discounted, right? Most universities and colleges didn't discount uh, what they were doing for uh, remote education, even though they weren't offering that face-to-face -face, uh, experience. Um, and because of this loyalty to higher ed's residential model, I think the opportunity to experience higher ed is still too scarce for too much of the world, right? We need to educate more people, not fewer people, but yes, yet our loyalty to this face-to-face -face residential model, I think really makes education too much of a scarce commodity at a time when it doesn't need to be that or shouldn't be that. Second is what I call uh, our allegiance to appointment education. You know, we used to have this thing called appointment TV uh, where you had to sit down, uh, I know I used to hate this growing up, right, where you had to sit down at a specific time, you had to be home at a specific time to watch a particular television 
a program or to more broadly go to a movie theater to see, a mo to see the latest release at a specific time. Well, now we all know we can stream anywhere at any time. We could also binge watch uh, entertainment if we're so motivated. And we now have a generation of students, Gen Z, right? They were born since 1995, who have grown up in an era where, where knowledge is everywhere, right? Where they can ask uh, Alexa uh, a, a, an answer, a question, and, and get an answer. Or they could Google something if they know, if they need to know something, right? They're accustomed to instant feedback on social media, and they really want quick responses to consumer brands. Yet, in higher education, or in education in general, we still have this idea of appointment education, right? Where knowledge is treated like a commodity that's delivered from a teacher, like I'm doing now, to students rather than something that's always on, delivered when needed, and throughout a person's life. So could we imagine how we stream entertainment now, moving to that in education, where we're streaming education all the time. And then finally, there's this outcomes piece of it. You know, the wage premium from higher ed has, has slowed in many countries, and we now have better data on earnings of specific degrees from specific universities. And consumers now have this information that they didn't have before. Now, we know that education is necessary. We know that it's worth it, but increasingly we are seeing consumers, and I'm seeing this really in the US now, where they want to know what they're getting in return for the cost of that uh, education. And they want to know that that education is both going to give them the immediate outcomes of a job, but that it's also going to arm them for lifelong learning. And they're not necessarily seeing the outcomes from higher education. So, what should we do about this? How should we prepare students for the transition to the workforce and workers for future jobs? You know, what is clear from my research is that for learners of all ages, breaking into the post-college job market is increasingly about the skills they possess. And for those, and we had a, a vibrant conversation about this at lunch, uh, for those who don't go to the most elite schools, it's less about the name brands and less about the specific degrees. And indeed, I think that one of the big things that's going to emerge from the pandemic is more skills-based hiring. Because as employers struggle to attract talent, they're going to be looking for specific skills because they're not necessarily going to be able to hire students with specific degrees from specific institutions. In a paper I co-wrote last year with the CEO of the labor market analytics firm Burning Glass, we identified, and we can put this slide up, we identified these 14 foundational skills critical to unlocking millions of jobs. Now, these skills, as we talked earlier today, go across a range of domains, right? Digital, human, and business, right? So they're both the hard skills and uh, the soft skills. And they're really the building blocks of successful careers, not only facilitating the first step, but also gaining importance over the span of the working life. And what's interesting is as you look around this circle, and I, this may be small for those folks in the back, is that you see that this is what companies and organizations are hiring for. It's not only where the jobs are, but it's also the increase in the number of job ads advertising for these skills. Now, many of these skills are human skills, right? Soft skills, human skills. Because we know that in an era of artificial intelligence and, and automation, that increasingly, as we saw in the video today, earlier today, that, that technology is eating um, many jobs. Now, if we go back through history, uh, that is, that's a narrative that's as old as the Industrial Revolution, even older than that, right? Technology has always taken away jobs. But the narrative has always been, at least by countries and by ministries of education and by institutions, that the more education you had, 
the better off you would be. You would be able to, in this long race between education and technology, as long as you had more education, you would come out ahead. And I think the question now is whether that's going to be true in this era of automation and artificial intelligence. Is more education, the question that I think that we have to grapple with is simply having more education going to be enough in this era or is having the right set of skills that complement technology and that give you and that give humans a unique selling proposition to employers, is that going to be much more critical in this decade uh, ahead? And while, and this is one of the concerns that I have around how we have established our traditional colleges and universities. I, as I mentioned earlier, I just finished this book on, on college admissions, and it's interesting when I talk to 18-year-olds about where they're going to college, the second question that people often ask them after they say, where are you going to study at university? The second question always is, what are you going to study, right? We put so much focus on, on the major. And when you look across colleges and universities, they tend to copy each other in terms of what they offer. Everybody has to have a philosophy department. Everybody has to have a political science department. While research is much more cross-disciplinary, I don't believe that these skills necessarily at most of our traditional colleges and universities are being delivered in that cross-disciplinary way, right? We organize our colleges and universities around, unfortunately, I think, the needs of the faculty. The faculty have to be organized in a certain way by departments. Uh, obviously, the faculty have disciplines, but then we basically port that over to offering students these specific majors when we know that these skills are cross-disciplinary and often cross-majors. So, what should we do about this? What should be on this roadmap for higher ed's future, and what should workers reskilling look like in the decade ahead? I wanna, I wanna put forward two ideas today, two waypoints on this map, if we think of this map for the next uh, decade ahead. One is academic programs, right? And, and Christine talked a lot about this this morning in talking about Station One, right? Designing academic programs for the 21st uh, century, right? How do we have academic programs that are relevant to the evolving uh, labor market? Uh, the paper that I wrote uh, with Burning Glass uh, a couple of months ago identified, for example, four distinct economies that we saw emerging from this pandemic worldwide. One was the readiness economy, right? So we know the pandemic has exposed how ill-prepared we were, uh, not only from a government perspective, but also from the private sector for global disruptions. We know we're gonna have more global disruptions, right? Which will require investments in healthcare, biotechnology, cybersecurity, green technology, infrastructure. This, in turn, will spur demand for graduates with skills in those areas. So as we're thinking about academic programs, what can we do in the readiness economy? The second is the remote economy, right? Remote work, we know, might be the most influential legacy of this pandemic. So the result will be a growing reliance on data, software, and the infrastructure that powers working from anywhere. What can we do as institutions to promote that. Third is the logistics economy, right? Global supply chains were interrupted by the virus and we know that they're already being reimagined, right? As manufacturers think about moving assembly lines uh, closer to consumers. So what will that require in terms of logistical support? So how can we as institutions support that? And then finally is the automated, account, uh, automated economy, right? Because the pandemic is likely only to accelerate the adoption of artificial intelligence, especially in, in knowledge work, as we heard earlier. So, so readiness economy, the remote economy, the logistics economy, the automated economy. These are ways that we should be thinking about as higher education systems of creating academic programs that serve this next economy rather than continue to cling to these old ways of organizing 
our uh, institutions. So it's not just topical areas, but also how we deliver uh, education. We really need to change our mindset from something that is episodic, as I talked about earlier, this idea that we stop doing something to go back to school, to something that is more continual. Uh, some work that I worked on at, when I was uh, a visiting scholar at Georgia Tech a couple of years ago was this idea of associating with our universities rather than enrolling, right? So right now we think uh, students are gonna enroll in college, they're gonna eventually graduate, and then they become alumni, right? In many ways, I think that these terms really need to become outdated. Right? We need to have learners who have affiliations with institutions throughout their lifetimes. Uh, that affiliation will be social and professional, like it is today, but it also could be educational, where learners see universities as providers of constant, always-on education and training that can be consumed in much the same way we use Netflix or YouTube today for entertainment. Right? Imagine if we turn on the Georgia Tech channel because we are an alum of Georgia Tech and we pay, just like we pay Netflix, uh, an annual subscription fee, we do the same thing with Georgia Tech to have access to constantly upgrade, reskill, and upskill throughout our um, lives. Um, this continual uh, constant streaming of education, I believe, as we talked about at lunch today, will be delivered in a blended way. So a mix between online and face-to-face. And -face. So this is an approach that I believe sits between the physical world that we've all become accustomed to before the pandemic and the online world that we either love or hate since the, the pandemic. Um, and because it meets students where they are, I think it actually could create better brand loyalty and better outcomes. Uh, when you're basically saying, students, if you want to take this course online, if you want to take this course face-to-face, -face, we are meeting their needs where they are, when they are. Uh, and I also think it makes our institutions much more resilient to future disruptions, right? We saw how many institutions, learning institutions, teaching institutions were disrupted by the pandemic because they didn't have that digital backbone to provide online education over the, last, uh, over the last 15 or 16 months, if we develop more of a hybrid approach to education, we will be ready for whatever that next big disruption is. Finally, I think we need to rethink traditional university degrees. We haven't talked a lot about credentialism today, uh, but largely people go to college and go to university to get that piece of paper that is a signal to the job market that you're ready for a job. We're not quite sure always what is embedded in that credential, but we know that it is a signal to the workforce. The problem is, is that most of the degree structures in most developed countries around the world were built when scarcity was the driving force in, in higher ed, and they were built for a much different economy and workforce. So I believe that we need to build credentials that are much more flexible in terms of time. So could you imagine a one course certificate or a one day certificate all the way up to a four year traditional uh, degree? Could we imagine degrees that are a mix of industry recognized certificates, right? There's been a lot of talk today about the Google certificates. Could we imagine something like that married to a traditional university degree so that we have both the hard skills and the soft skills. And finally, I believe that we need to give learners more control over what they know and to showcase that to employers. I always tell the story that when I went back to apply uh, for a program to get my EDD many years ago, uh, I had to go and get my undergraduate transcript. I had to go get my graduate transcript. It took me many weeks to get assets of my learning that were of my learning, right? I didn't own them. I didn't own these assets that were critical for me to move on to the next stage 
of my own learning. But could you imagine, and I think this goes back to the whole blockchain uh, conversation from earlier, could you imagine that if learning was always on, that assessment of that learning was always on, and that we carried in our pockets something that would be verified, that would show what we learned when we learned it, and would be able to show it to employers or anybody else that might um, acquire, inquire about it. So it's clear from the economic data right now that there is this great reassessment going on. I, I, when we were talking earlier about what the last 15 months mean for the future of work, it's clear that on many different levels, people are thinking about doing something different. Uh, you know, entire sectors of the economy have been obviously decimated by the pandemic, but at the same time, people are thinking that they want to do something else with their lives. And they're thinking about what, they, what are the skills that they need, right? What are the skills they need? Where do they get them? And how long is the shelf life of those skills? I've been thinking about that uh, often lately. I was supposed to celebrate my 25th college reunion last year. We're now going to celebrate it this year, hopefully. Um, and I've been thinking about my degree. My undergraduate degree was in journalism. Uh, which, as we learned earlier, uh, bots are going to start writing articles pretty soon, so I guess I would be out of a job anyway. But if we could put up this next slide. This is a, a, an analysis. I hope there was another slide. There it is. This was an analysis of job ads for journalists uh, that was done by MZ, which has just been bought by uh, Burning Glass, which is another labor market analytics firm. And what it shows, uh, so the bubble size reflects the relative demand for each skill, right? But web analytics, team management, web design, uh, right? There's all of this stuff that is much more technical than it is for any of the skills that I learned just 25 years ago. And what I think this shows is that almost in any job now, the churn in skills is just moving f ever faster than before. And if we continue to believe that education is something that only happens to young people, only happens one time in life, and that all of our consumer information is geared towards that persona of students, right? So that, that student coming out of high school and going to college, rather than the persona of any of us in this room who might need upskilling, right? We are gonna constantly, I think, fail to serve the needs of this economy, of, of the post-pandemic era that we're about to enter. So I appreciate your time today, and, uh, and thank you.